Hey, welcome back, everybody, to my podcast. And this episode features Jonas Machulis. Jonas is a good friend of mine now. After coaching him for several years with the national team, we had a good conversation today about his lessons as a player, as well as in the national team and Real Madrid and other places. He talked about the lessons he took from being a player to now being a GM, sports director, slash everything else at a, at a club in Kedaini, near Vigis, in the Lithuanian League. And he talked about everything he learned from Pablo Lasso, from players, teammates, competitive practices, and all the good stuff behind the scenes that everybody wants to hear about. So please tune in, subscribe to this podcast, share this episode. Thanks for being a loyal listener. And for all the new ones, looking forward to seeing you soon again. Also, I may add, this episode features our new sponsor, which I also introduced in our last episode, ProBallers.com. ProBallers.com is the statistical website for all the nerds out there. It features over 70 leagues around the world and newly added NCAA teams that you can also search and research and analyze and all the good stuff. So please go to proballers.com. And during this episode, you will also see a short little segment with Jonas that we tried a little search feature that you may enjoy. All right. Thank you very much and talk soon. Bye. Jonas, bajoyam. <laughs> right. Let's try. Let's try English now. Now you're on my home turf, buddy. You're you're known you're known as my Lithuanian teacher, and now uh, I'm gonna have to restrain myself not to correct you in English. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it because my English is not so good. You can correct me whenever you want, like I did, <laughs> like I did years ago in the in our scouting reports. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt every little uh, every little lesson. So what what's the what's the the first story that pops into your mind about my Lithuanian uh, mistakes, which is obviously for Lithuanians probably more interesting, but maybe for the English speaking listeners. I mean, I mean, for sure, I can, it was so many mistakes. I I cannot one, uh, uh, but of course, like this, uh, the, the 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 most I don't know magical world uh, word was. Uh, Finte, which was like <laughs> the rest of the game, of the game, uh, like Finte with his tricks, which hey, does, hey, you hey, cannot hey. use it in the basket language. <laughs> now, obviously, obviously you can. With Benas, anything is possible. So you can, you can. Yeah, it was possible and Benas was trying to, to show everybody that, you know, you know Lithuanian, but it was funny. <laughs> So, so today we will talk about uh, your little bit of your player career and then a little bit uh, on your management executive career that you transitioned to. In the middle, we're going to do a segment for, for proballers.com and uh, we're going to analyze some things on, uh, on a, box sheet, a box score sheet. But it's nothing, nothing too specific. Just want to know your opinion. And uh, before, we, before we get to that point, what's the first, the first memory that comes to mind besides my stories? Uh, the first memory that comes to mind from your player career that you feel like you you cherish not one game or one but just the situation you were in was like I would like to go back to that any any day any any time. I mean, uh, I would like to to go. Of course, you know the the, the most uh, memorable game and uh, the most famous game of mine uh, was against uh, Georgia. Uh, whatever now you call how you call it in English, uh, I don't know like how you call it. So I mean, of course, this game I can, I watching it. I don't know how many times I watched it, but I would like to go back to the game in in uh, in Madrid or Barcelona when we lost against uh, France. Bronze medals we lost in the last seconds. I would like to go there. And it was enough just to, to say to Martina Spots, let's go, let's go faster to go as fast as half court. <laughs> and it, enough. I would like to go there to say, hey, let's go faster than half court. And we not going to be able to have a bronze medal. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was in Madrid. Cause the, the second stage was in Barcelona. Madrid. The final stage was in Madrid. And, Madrid, Madrid, Madrid yes. and, and uh, I remember that game too. Do you, I, I forgot who was guarding him on that play. Um, nobody but, was guarding. No, nobody was guarding. But, but that's that's the thing. That's the thing. There was somebody. There was somebody guarding him two meters away. I think, and I don't know if it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I was next to the half court, and he was. Uh, there was one guy two meters away, and he was there just walking. You know, like it was like, well, 
<laughs> yeah, but I would I would like to know if that player and I forgot if I, maybe it was Edwin Jackson even because he was there too. Did did he not pressure him on purpose so Mar Martin doesn't speed up? You know, because yeah. you can that's the next level that you 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 see that the time is ticking and you just kind of leave him because you see he's walking. If you pressure him, he's gonna speed up and gonna cross the half court. So that's that's also that's something I would like to know. You will never know. We will never, never know. <laughs> I would like to go to that game because that game till now hurt. That that game for me hurts like probably the most, the most till now with national team. Yeah, yeah, it was it was painful. It was painful afterwards because you felt like you had a, you played a really good tournament and you you deserved both teams deserve it at the end. You know when when they play and for those medals, but it was something that just it slipped out of your hand. You just you had it. You slipped it slipped out of it. Anyway, we go to better things. Uh, or before we go to better things, let's talk about injuries. <laughs> but it's not better things. But you you went through some injuries in your past. You had a you had a torn ACL. I remember it was early to midway through your career, but it was something that happened, and you had to go through extended rehabilitation process on your knee. I remember you had to go down a notch to play in a lower level in Lithuania. What what emotions do you remember going through? What what thoughts were racing through your mind when you were going on the road to recovery, let's call it, because it's something that every athlete dreads, doesn't want it to happen, but it happens a lot. And then there's a lot of athletes that have to go through that rehabilitation process. Was there, was there something you were feeling? Was there something that you were focused on specifically, something that mindfully you did to look forward, not backward? First of all, first of all, going back to the memories, of course, uh, it was, uh, I say, bad experience yeah, for sure. But uh, there was some things like, uh, like I remember till now. Uh, the first memory was uh, and uh, the support I got from my friends and my agent and my family was incredible. I remember very good. And uh, uh, after surgery, I was, uh, I say, I was high because of the <laughs> of, uh, of the medicine. Morphine was. When I was sleeping because of the painkillers, I was kind of sleeping and so on. I remember, I remember that uh, I had some visitors, and then I woke up in the middle of, at, the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the middle of the night, and I see some of my friends sleeping on a couch next to next to my bed, and they were watching they were watching uh, basketball, you know, and uh, and I was like, okay, like uh, these friends, like going through through this with me together, you know, another, another thing, um, like, uh, of course, family and the uh, agent, uh, Maurizio Balducci, who passed away um, five years ago now, 2018. Yes. So uh, this Maurizio Bal Balducci was like, um, okay, family was, you know, supporting me emotionally when it was hard, you know, or something happened, you know, when I'm struggling with recovery because I had some, uh, after a few months, I had some inflammation in my knee. I had to sit, to stay back again for like a few weeks and so on and so on. So family supported me every, every day. Maurizio Balducci was, how to say, a little bit harsh to me. Like, um, he opened my eyes and said, listen, Jonas, what do you think? Basketball going to stop because you, what you think you, you are a national team, you are playing in Milan. And you think because of your injury, basketball gonna stop? Basketball didn't stop. Jordan finished his career. Nope, nothing. Nothing gonna have, Nothing gonna change. So it's up to you. Don't 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 need to. I say to act like victim. You need mm -hmm. to be a and do your do your job. So actually, it was for me. It was many people and many many coaches and. Uh, People from basketball world already said that okay, Machul is probably never going to recover because you know of my, you know these injuries for my type of my my style my type of players who is always going with the full power strong you know everything everything doing with the power not with the finesse or uh, yeah. technique talent you know so for these injuries was very deep. it's very difficult for this type of players. And everybody was skeptical about my recovery and coming back to, to basketball. At least if I will be, maybe I will come back, but if I'm going to be able to perform at the same level, like before, before injury. So 
national team doctors, trumpeters, tennis gurus, teatras, nikuchones, which you know very good. You know they helped me a lot through the process. I was kind of re recovered after seven months, but something happened again, and my I don't know my knee started. My power in my knee disappeared. Like after I started to play uh, to play basketball already, the bulk of us at that time was second Jalgiris team, kind of. And uh, I started to play with them, practice with them. And I said, okay, I, I don't feel comfortable. I need to go back again to weightlifting room to Sigitas Kavalauskas took me for another two months. And after two months, had preparation, very hard practices. Two times a day, I came back after exactly after nine months, one day before my birthday, uh, to play to play the game against black team. I think well, if I remember, okay, good. And uh, I remember, and uh, when I when I said play the game, my agents came, Stefano Lupatelli, Matteo Zred, with uh, Maurizio Balducci, they came. They came to watch the game, and I remember very good. After the very, very first contact, uh, I felt on the floor next to their legs, and I grabbed my knee. I said, oh. I said, stand up. Stand up and go. Just, you know, you need, you need to overcome this, these mental things, and so on and so on. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize how powerful is this um, and how, how hard, actually, it is to overcome this mental problems after recovering, uh, you know, from injury, how you protect yourself, how your body actually protects yourself. So after injury, then I started already to play one and a half month, every small contact to my knee, every small contact I've, I would fall on the floor and grab my knee and like, oh, is it okay? Is it okay? I would mm -hmm. react like, like, uh, like this, like one and a half month. So this experience later on, you know, Help, help me with other injuries because I knew what, what is waiting, what kind of mental things I will have to overcome, what kind of I don't know, process I will need to overcome, recovery, and so on and so on. So this was experience of one month, of one, of one year, where I didn't know if I'm going to come back or if I'm going to come back, if I'm going to be the same level player. And then, you know, I was 20 six years old, yes, 26 years old at that time. And I would say my future, like financial future was not ready yet and so on and so on. I already had a baby and many, many, many things, many struggles at the, at the same time you know, that you need to deal with. It's, it was, it was hard. There was, there was no, uh, how would say, other way to do your best, to try to do your best and overcome everything. Another way was to give up, but this is not, not the way for me. <laughs> not an option. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something, it's something that you, you learn, you know, once you fight through those tough times, you create easy times after that, you know, because you, everything else, everything else ranks below that, unless you have something, as we talked before, something that's going to happen, that's way above it, that's traumatic or tragic, then you have a different mind shift. But if you go through those tough times, which in reality, if every athlete at some point, more or less, some injuries will, are going to happen, you're going to have to deal with it. And I had, I had, uh, now you said when you have these phantom, phantom reactions, you know, you feel like you're, you're insecure about your knee. After, after my, my ACL, my first ACL, it didn't, it didn't, my ACL was not the problem. The second injury that I had, I was wearing a knee sleeve a lot of times for a year. And I'm, I'm starting to think if you wear a knee sleeve, even though it just gives you comfort, it's your, it's your, and it gives you confidence, you still subconsciously, you still think, and you know that something is wrong with that knee, you know? And I'm, I'm not sure if that's, if that's a, if that can be a mental hurdle deeply mental, subconsciously, and still you protect yourself because eventually my body shifted because I was protecting my knee subconsciously after, after, you know, playing on, on, after the second surgery. And that's something um, that I think also has to be probably studied. Maybe it's studied already. I'm just hypothesizing. Yeah, but doctor, doctors, uh, like the doctors who was taking care of me, they said, I like, don't wear any sleeves immediately. They just, you need to, like mentally, your body needs to adjust immediately. Same. And 
very next day, very next day after surgery, after surgery, I remember, uh, I remember Gudas came to wake me up uh, in the hospital and said, stand up and go. Where to go? What to do? No, 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 just stand up and go. Like, go. <laughs> so your branches and go. I said, I cannot do anything. So they tried to lift my, my leg, the, sur- the leg which was operated after surgery. And because of the pain, it bend, it bended a little bit. The knee bended a little bit. And because of the f- pain, I faded. I had to uh, he said, stop faking, go. You need to go. <laughs> no, you go, you know, you need to start as soon as possible and you need to, to go. So this was, they were forcing me actually. They did, they probably, they understood that I feel pain. They understood what I'm going through, but they were, they were forcing me. There was no pity. There was no, no, you gotta say this, uh, they didn't. I was, they didn't, they they didn't like, treat you. They, they didn't treat you like a victim. Yeah, like, like I said, no, no, no. You just need, you need to go. Don't think about it. Every okay. You already we made surgery. Everything is is good. Your ligaments are okay. That's it. You you cannot do anything else. Just go. Just, of course, don't do don't do anything. Don't do. I I, I did a very crazy thing. <laughs> well, three uh, three weeks after it was my bachelor party. <laughs> <laughs> They're good as, they're good as that I came to the hospital again to, to take out the liquids from me. <laughs> so, I don't know, for yeah. 10 minutes, my words is okay. What you did to this doctor, I, we never heard him yelling at somebody, at the patient. We never heard yelling for 10 minutes straight and every, all, all the, 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 all the floor of uh, this remaking surgery is all the, the third floor of hospital was waiting next to the door what, to see what happened. At, at, who is that person <laughs> that good as is yelling at? So I, I, you want to hurt yourself and all this. I remember this. Okay. Then I, I took it serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, something, sometimes that's something that, that you need. I, and I, we can transition into, into uh, coaching you because uh, I was wondering two things. You know, what, how you how it was to to play for Pablo because when you play for Pablo he has a specific way of handling players you know and maybe you can give it reflect a little bit on how he handled different personalities on Real Madrid when when you were playing for him and the second part especially would you would you categorize yourself as being hard to coach or not hard to coach and why why would you be uh, hard to coach in in what regard okay first of all first of all I probably I am I say, I'm hard to coach, but if you are coaching, I will give you an example. For example, I'm if you are if the coach tells me to do to play me on the low post to set, he wants to play me on the low. He wants me to play a lot of on a low cross screens and so on. It's okay. I will and he will and he will say, okay, you get the ball in a low post. And you, you, or you play by yourself or, or we have this play uh, back screens or whatever for shooters or whatever. I'm coachable about this and I don't need to score every time. But then I came in Milano, uh, during the first practices, they gave me uh, one exercise, one drill, where actually I had to start from the opposite three point line, dribble all the way to, to let's say another three point line and take a shot. And I was like, what are you doing? He said, hey, we checked you shooting 40%, please. So we want you to become a shooter. Me, shooter. <laughs> dribble, the ball, dribble the ball. And I actually, because I know that this is not my game, I actually refused. I, I, I started to I'll say, kind of to fight with the coach. Immediately, I refused to be coachable in this way because this is completely nonsense. Like, you cannot do it. You know, it looked like for, for three months in Milano, it looked like they didn't know what kind of player they, they signed. They wanted me to shoot threes, go out of the standards, shoot press, and so on and so on. So for this thing, because I already knew what kind of player I am, low post rebounds, I can make three, of course, but I cannot go run standards and so on. And like to yeah. shoot this. If, if, uh, if you are coaching me, let's say, my strengths, 
I think I'm coaching. I can be, I, I'm coachable, right? This is okay. Yes, I, yes, uh, yes. I have no problems with coaches and coaches won't have problems with me because I'm always going to be 100% on defense, whatever. And then, okay. But then coaches, they don't know me like a player or they don't know how to use me and they start. They they put me in a uncomfortable positions. Then kind of I have that fighting mentality. I like to rebel. To yeah. <laughs> I like I like. So these uh, these are these are things that uh, I mean I didn't have any problems with Lasso. I didn't have any problems with Argiris Pedulakis, for example. I didn't have any problems with uh, Grigas and Jalgiris. With Sireka, because they kind of knew how to use me, they used my strengths. They not they all of them. I think knew that they, what they're gonna what they're gonna get from me on defense. This is one thing, and then I am just they they had to how to say to know how to use the right way on offense and, and I don't know. Actually, I need to ask you if I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Like <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we talk about Pablo, uh, to finish off about you, the, the the things that I remember mostly was yes, you you were persistent on on doing on being used the right way and and doing things the right way in general, not only in regards to you but also in regards to the team because you cared you cared as much about the team as you did about yourself or about where you put yourself in the best position to be successful. But the thing that I remember was also that you always love to talk. <laughs> you love to talk. You had, you had, you had a lot of opinions and you had, you, it's almost like you overanalyzed every situation where you didn't have to overanalyze every situation, you know, and that sometimes distracted yourself. You distracted yourself from what you could do best. I think that was something yeah. that, that, that was maybe something that I reflect. And that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually the same, the same. In a daily life, I actually overthink a lot and too analyzing too much. If I'm gonna do this, what that one's gonna yeah. happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I need to control this. I need to control that. And what's gonna happen with my daughters as well? Don't don't run, don't run, don't do this. Like on Friday, last Friday, I said to my daughter, she was playing around, the, jumping over uh, hurdles. Yeah, uh, hurdles. Yeah. Well, the herbals, and uh, I said, "Stop playing because you might hurt yourself." And ah, nah, nah. she kept playing, broke an arm. I said, "I told you," because I was already analyzing, and I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I told you. <laughs> well, that's so, a lesson. That's a lesson. That's a lesson they can learn. Yeah. I like. I like to to have sit to overthink and maybe some to distract myself from from real life or what is most important. Actually, I think. I think. Uh, maybe not all athletes, but a lot of athletes um, that were at the highest level, and and I think the same applies for coaches. A lot of the times, there is natural overthinking because of the options that you have in your head of what could go wrong and how it sh could go right. You know, so you have the longer you play, the higher you play, the more options open up, and you then then all of a sudden you have to start learning to close those doors to make sure that you are staying, you know, with two three possible options, and then. Be okay with all of them, you know, because it, I, I've experienced from the coach's perspective, when we're in a coach's locker room, we're discussing every single thing and it's impossible to predict every single thing. So you're trying to narrow down to two, three options. Well, let's pick and roll defense, how you want to defend the pick, the pick and roll in this particular game. And then, you know, there's this way, this way, that way. And whichever decision you, have, you go with, you have to go with. It's not going to be the perfect one and you eliminate the ones that you for sure don't want to use, and you have to go with what's, what your gut and what your experience at that point says. So it's more about the higher you go, the more options, the more just windows, doors, everything is open up, and you, stop, you, you have to learn to start closing them because the experience also gives you, allows you to do so. Exactly, exactly. Basketball has, somebody told basketball is, is not about, is, is a game of mistakes. Who, so we are... And we are analyzing what can go wrong and what mistakes we can do and what goes. So, so who does less mistakes wins, of course. So you know, but but when you're overthinking, 
leads, you know, to more and more and more mistakes. So yeah, you're right. So I need to, to, to learn how to close some doors. And, and then anyway, to, to narrow to these three things, which is most common or with the biggest percentage, you know, low yes. percentage happen, but ability you have to deal with. Yeah, just the, the probability theory of what's what what probably yeah. will go the highest probability. That's what you, the one you go with. And like something is happening in bas in basketball. When I remember years ago, we played the uh, Panathinaikos uh, Barcelona quarterfinal. We were uh, defending some. We were using some crazy defense with Damon Tidis and let Victor Sada to shoot three point shot, and he yeah. made and they. And we didn't go right for the front final box. And you were shooting, I don't know, two percent three point shots. <laughs> well, you remember you remember 2016 Olympics against Spain. We we, we risk on Rubio and Rubio made right. every every single three almost. I think he was like five, five or six, something like that. He was crazy. This is accepted. But you live. <laughs> and that's the thing. That's the, that's the difference when you play one game to win or lose in a series, in the final four or a series, because in the series, you take the chances. You don't overreact overreact to one sh good shooting game. You keep playing the same way because you believe that the percentages, they will regress to the mean. You know, the average, they will average out at some point. So one game in a series should not make a difference in that. But in the one one game wins it all, it can't. And that's that's the difference. How was it with Pablo? What's what? Well, how did Pablo work with players and how was his? Because I talked to him in, in, in regards of personality management and everybody's different. So I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective of how you how you perceived his coaching. I, I, I listened to post, uh, post your podcast, Pablo. I, I heard I heard it. And uh, what? Well, first of all, when it comes to, when it comes to personality management, personality ma management, mm -hmm. I think so far, Pablo is the best, the best in that, in that, in that job and in, in doing that, I don't know. So many personalities, so different personalities, cultures, so different. I don't know my the minds uh, when we had in in Real Madrid. Uh, when I was the first year was two Argentinians, Mexican, Lithuanian, from uh, Tunisian, Greek, uh, Spanish, Americans. Uh, one is Mormon, one is Muslim, one one is. I mean. I mean, so many, so many different personalities, so many different uh, ideas and so on. And I was surprised that I was, I was really amazed how he was dealing with these personalities and how he, he knew exactly when, when to push one player, when to a little bit too late. Okay, this player maybe is too much for Then to say something. And to Spanish guys in the right moment, you know, because every, everybody knows how in Spain, in, not in Spain, in general, the local players, how we, they are treated in Spain, in Spain, in Spain, Spanish, and so on and so on. So most of the times, you know, then you already Pablo tells something to Philip or to, to Sergio Yul or to Rudy. Things are serious, guys. <laughs> we need to pay. <laughs> so, all these things, you know, uh, I was surprised. I, I was amazed until now, you know, I, I am now when I'm more or less not, I'm not coach, but I'm uh, working as a GM and I know, know how I see how people are reacting in different situations, how, or how they overreacting or not doing something because they used to do universities other things but in Europe now it's different and so on how to give advice is how to help them and so on Pablo Pablo is and that is the best so far what I what I know maybe I'm gonna meet another players coaches or somebody else I think I I think there, there are many coaches like like Pablo who is dealing with these personalities I, I think most most of them works in in MBA because we need to do it. Is that yeah. <laughs> in Europe it's a little bit different because you can find players, you can fire players, contracts are not guaranteed, and so on and so on. Guarantee, but we are not guaranteed. So players here are acting a little bit different. But in the highest level around Barcelona, I don't know, Panathinaikos, Olympiakos, uh, uh, 
or much FS. All these main teams, they have some personalities, egos, guys who want to win, and everybody thinks that they can win by themselves. Not everybody, but leaders and so on, and you know, how to force them to force them in a nice way, in a correct way, in a political way, to 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 play as one one fist, one one team. It's it was amazing to watch. I li I liked it very much. What did he do different? What was what made him like? What what's something that just he just charisma? Is it just natural? I mean, natural charisma, yes. And sometimes we already know. I, I, we already spoke about the, uh, the King's Cup preparation. <laughs> Totally both <laughs> until I find out what is going on. Oh, <laughs> That situation about uh, the King's Cup preparation. I said, "Ah, oh, okay. Next year, I, I, I gotta know." You know. So it was. He has some uh, some methods. Do you want to tell the story? Do you want to tell the story or not? I mean, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> okay, don't, don't, don't. Like, we don't, we don't want to. I don't. Maybe Pablo now gonna do it. <laughs> I am everybody know, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there will be no reaction, you know. Yes, 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 yes. Let's keep, yeah, let's bro. keep, let's keep, let's keep our mouths <laughs> closed. So, how he is uh, in a certain way uh, trying to get reactions from players uh, for the right game? It's it's sometimes you maybe don't understand. Of course, some. Most of the times, players don't understand coaches' decision, and they think that coaches are stupid. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you get the full picture and you realize why he did this, ah, okay, ah, yes, we reacted like he wanted, like we reacted and we did what he actually, he actually provoked that reaction yeah. and reacted in that way he expected, you know. So, so these these things are. Uh, I don't know. He would. I think Pablo, Pablo before Real, the final four in Real, in, in the Real but in, in Madrid, and we played in Madrid 2015. I think even before he said, we, we, We're going to win. Guys, we're going to win. He drew, I remember he drew, he drew some, some on a whiteboard, he draw some things like, Guys, we're going to win. I feel it. Like There's no other way, you know. And then again, the next year, so I say, guys, guys, <laughs> we granted to win. He didn't say that we are not not gonna not gonna win, but he said we need to do better. We need to do something extra, you know. And this this he has a feeling about his team. He has a feeling how where to push, where to where to has to to be to relax and so on and. He had that feeling perfect, perfect feeling yeah. about everything. Yeah, it's, I think that's the thing that it comes with experience that you, once you feel what your team needs and you understand that the team, that the team is different this year than last year, you also can navigate the waters a little bit and you can manipulate or in, in a way project of what's going to happen. And you're trying to also, you have to have the right personnel. So with veterans, it's probably easier to do so than with young guys. With young guys, you probably have to be a little bit different. You know, there's always... Every team, every roster is so much so different. So it's kind of, and the, he's been around the block a little bit. So he knows, he understands the nuances of what to do and when to do what. Well, it's veterans. These veterans, uh, Sergio, Rudy, Felipe, Chad, now Chacho came back, you know. All these veterans, they already know. They look at Pablo, you know, what Pablo wants to do, what to call and so on. It was, it was amazing. How was the communication between Pablo and Sergio, or, or on the wrong book and so on? It was the something goes wrong. They said, "Okay, we need technical. We need technical foul. It's, it's a right time to get a technical foul because when, it, when the time go, comes, last seconds, they're gonna go crazy. It's gonna they're gonna time to get like they're gonna the referee is gonna give a technical to the other side, but it's gonna." hurt them more because it's going to be like tie game and 20 seconds left you know so all this you no know, tactical the communication and everything veterans and so on and so on was amazing and then all these veterans were nice guys yeah. really nice guys you know, who 
who help young guys, who help foreigners, who who explain things, you know, because they already, let's say, before I came to Real Madrid 2014, uh, Pablo was there already two years, something like this. Uh, One, more, no, two or three, because I was in Moscow. Came to, the, from 2011, right? Yeah, three years, I think he was there already, because I was here. Yeah. yeah. So, so already players knew Pablo, Pablo knew first day. Immediately when we joined, the new guys, me, Baku, I don't know, Gustavo, Ayon, all these new players, when we really already immediately explained me how it works, what kind of practices, what we need to do, how to not in conflict, and so on and so on. It was so smooth. The transition was so smooth because of the veterans that, yeah. Yes. Easy, easy life for for everybody who knew who's coming in to to understand to get the system immediately. Yes, but but it's not more about the basketball system. It's about the system how the life works in Real Madrid. About all this, where you need to do what you need to do, where you need to go, how you need to go. Like small thing, you know, guys. If practice is longer, guys, it, uh, one o'clock starts traffic because it's siesta time. If you if you <laughs> You leave now, you go, go, you, you reach your house like in 20 minutes. But if you want to do massage, so do, do it for two hours because, or you're, you're going to sit for two hours in traffic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. For small things that they explained it immediately. I said, why? From, from, from Carmelo. I said, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the different, different world. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go into the segment before we before we transition to to uh, to your new career. Um, Want to analyze a little bit on my sponsor ProBallers.com. Uh, we're gonna analyze a little bit of the uh, the um, your career a little bit. Some some things that we're gonna go through, and uh, hopefully you can help me to to understand something. You can see my screen. Yes. All right. We're here at ProBalls.com, and uh, I'm going to go to to the homepage. And here I am going to put in your name and search search for Jonas Machulis. And here's your pretty face and then uh, your statistics a little bit from your last season. But I want to do a trick or I want to I wanna test you. Mm -hmm. So we can search here. We can search for teammates. And... Uh, if if we go into that segment, I uh, can. If I go down, all the teammates here by are by alphabetical order, as I see. I'm wondering if you can guess if I put press on games now. It's gonna order the the ones that you played with the most. Can you guess which which player you played with the most throughout your career? Oof. Yeah, I mean, this national team including everything, or... everything. Yes, national team also. Ah, oh, no. It's going to be uh, probably Ancunas or Kalnetis if it's the national team. Are you sure about that? Wait. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> wait. Maybe even Ma wait, Marco Slaughter, maybe. Uh, <laughs> we're getting close. Okay. It's, I don't know. Wait, Marco Slaughter okay. only. Like Marcus Ross, uh, yes, water so three years, two years in Real Madrid, two years in the, in the, in the, in the, in the I, okay, third Lens guess, those two, those two guesses, now the third guess. Wait, 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 wait. who was, I, I would say yes, Jan Kunas or Kalnetis, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Don't know we All right. So, is for, uh, uh, four years in Jalgiris junior team, four years in Jalgiris. Ten years in national team. I mean, for sure, like who else? <laughs> uh, all so, right. So, so if I tell you it was somebody from Real Madrid, how who would you guess it's uh, if it's from Real Madrid? So, Chelsea probably. Felipe. Felipe was close, but it's J.C. Carroll. Whoa, J.C. Carroll. We played together two hundred. 212 games, yep. And uh, with Felipe, 207, and Calnietis and Yankunas, you're right on. It was re really close, third and fourth place. 
and then Gustavo yeah. at, in fifth place, 180. So, so you can see that Real Madrid, you didn't you didn't miss a lot of games, I think, and uh, also the, you can see the teammates here that uh, I think JC also barely missed any games. He was always always playing. Oh my god, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some information uh, in, Real Madrid, in Real Madrid. They didn't miss any games, any games, no injuries, no no nothing. So uh, I uh, no no I missed I missed a few games because my shoulder was dislocated. Yeah yeah, but I missed a few games. Okay. In four years. All right, that was the exercise for today, Jonas. Oh my God! <laughs> I didn't know that there is an option like this. Okay, now I know. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a cool and also the opponents. Also, you can ch check which opponents you played against the most, so we can check that as well. Right, press it. Right. Who is that? The, Who is that? The one you played against the most would be. Right, of Perperoglu. <laughs> yes, Perperoglu, thirty-eight games. And then and then Sato thirty games. It's crazy, huh? Stratos. I mean, if Stratos, El Perro, I mean, we we travel. Uh, he is Olympiacos and the bike because he is Barcelona and Real Madrid. He is. You always like you always faced each other also uh, on on the, on the post. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's move on to your new career. Um, so, is there something? Is there something you believed in as a player when before you got this job that you completely changed your opinion on now with this job? Is there something that you that comes to mind that you feel like, man, as a player I thought this, but now I'm I'm looking at it from a different angle because I worked this uh, behind the scenes as a as a GM. I mean, I mean, okay. The the biggest the biggest change is dealing with agent because when I was a player, agents was on my side. Now, now we are <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is the biggest difference in the, in the, in this job. But, um, I actually was thinking about, about the last, last few years of my career. I was discussing Stefan Olupaka and, and, and Maurizio Balducci was alive. We were, still... we were talking a lot what I should do after. And Maurizio Balducci told me to try to do kind of, kind of like postcard podcast or like uh, during the games uh, to comment the games, how you call it. Uh, analyst commentator. Like analyst commentator and so on and so on. He said, I think you would be good in this position. And then the year is like, I would like to stay more connected to basketball than I say, more to live, little bit to live that. I would say basketball life, trip, trips, uh, coming to practices, the lock, okay, locker room is different now, coaches locker room, not players locker room, but to live that, to continue to live that life, to be really close to basketball, not just to talk and analyze everybody. You know? So for me, this like this 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 choice is or this choice so mine is I think I'm very happy about. And uh, I think I'm learning I'm learning many things. Of, for sure, I'm learning many things. Yeah, you know how to to to, to print, not to print, but to type uh, to type the contracts, how to put the details, how to to different countries, English, Lithuanian, and so on, so how different laws, different, different. And so I'm learning this stuff because I didn't need it when yeah. I was a player. You know? Yeah, your but, agents took care of that. Yeah, agents yeah. Yeah, took care of this. So now I'm dealing with it from team side. I'm doing many, many things that we are a small club. Only, I would say, our office is three people, you know, and an owner, owner plus three three people, so so it's very small a small club, and we need we need to share many many things, you know, which usually probably I I'm not to I'm, I'm I I consider a sport director, which I'm not supposed to do. Let's say to meet VAP person at the at the entrance, you know, to me to do uh, to do many things that I'm doing. Just because we're a small club, you know. But I'm that kind of person that always said, 
the, the leader, uh, the boss, the leader, the, he needs to know what is going on from a lowest level. Like what are the, the what are the struggles of laundry, laundry woman, leaders, yep. uh, all the state. He needs to understand the, the struggles of from the ground up, from the ground up. So this is this is what I'm doing here in in this club. I know what are the struggles. I know now 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 let's say we even learn how to count. Okay, five guys are taping. Everybody use this. So we need five tapes per, per practice. Uh, so we need to order for one month. We need to do this. three three and a half boxes. Okay, and then you know. Okay, you inventory inventory. So already you know that you have two weeks left and you need to, to, to order again. And, you know, all these small things, you know, you, you're learning, you're studying, you, you're, you're taking inside like experience. And then maybe, maybe I'm going to, maybe I will have a chance one day to, to, to do it at a higher level. Who knows? Maybe I'm going to stay here forever. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> no, it's, that's, it's a great learning experience because of the hands-on experience. I think for it's probably also very useful to go to a, to a smaller club at first, just to see everything from the ground up and see every every level that it takes to to go up. And then step by step, you you will understand once once you go further that already this can be taken care of by this person, this can be taken care of by this person, and you it, it will be easier. I think that's it's probably the perfect transition actually, if you think about it. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's perfect or no, but uh, you know there are. I think two, I would say two ways of doing this. You finish and you uh, stay next to the GM and learn, let's say, kind of yeah. like Jan Kunas did, Mote Yunas. Yeah, right. You can do this, or I became immediately and I'm learning from my mistakes. I'm doing mistakes because nobody is giving advices to me. You know, like, no, there is nobody next to me who did this job. Who, more years and we have more experience, you know, so I'm doing this job. Actually, I know, I know what mayor, this is, I'm still kind of like everybody likes to say, you need to kill a player in, in yourself when you finish your career. <laughs> you know? but that's the tough part. part. That's the tough part. That's the tough part, but it helps me because I know what are the needs of a player. Who oh, they need therapists, they need this, they need this, how to feel it, how, uh, how to, um, when a player lands after a long trip, you know, that you need to go to, to, or to, to come to meet him in an airport before the season, let's say, with the food, because he, he needs to eat. He, yeah. he doesn't need to travel from Vilnius to Kadaini two hours with an empty stomach, you know, you need to talk, you, you know, all these small things, you know, I know from a player's perspective, and then players comes and they find, they find this, look like, hey, this is a small club, but but you take care of uh, very small details, you know, yes, for details, player, which we cannot pay big salaries, but we can, we can take care of these small details, which gives, uh, I don't know, confidence, trust, not confidence, trust from players, you know, and they say, okay, they're taking care of us. We need to, we need to do our job, you know, we need to give something back, you know, so this is, we, we, we are a small club and we need to, the only thing for us, which we can have advantage in front of bigger clubs by doing small things good, good, really good, you know, small details to take care of small, small details for players not to have any thoughts. And it's a competitive, it's a competitive advantage also because players talk, agents talk, everybody talks behind the scenes and they say, okay, this is a small club, but it's a good starting point because they take care of you personally and it will be a comfortable transition, let's say, if you're a rookie, if you're somebody that's experienced in Europe for the first time or had some bad experiences before, the agents know, the sports directors, everybody around knows that everybody talks and the players will find out wh whether something is right or wrong. I remember in Germany, I was in a small club in Germany uh, uh, in second division and we were already, uh, when I was already coaching there, I remember I was picking up players from the airport because I was the fluent English speaker. I could connect with them easily. It was an easy transition. It was something that they could feel comfortable, you know, talking about anything. It's not something that that they don't they don't they feel that they don't they're not understood. So it was easy from that perspective. 
but also the one of the small detail that I always kept in mind was we had we had a lady that was uh, uh, responsible for the finances, but like you said, in a small club, everybody does everything. It's it's you have to help in every corner. If there's somebody that the mattresses need to be picked up in 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 the in the in the floor and the, whatever whatever it is, and she was always whenever the new player arrived, she she, she prepared the apartment beforehand. And the refrigerator was always full. The refrigerator was full with food, with drinks, with uh, any any kind of specialties from our area, which was fish. So everything was prepared for the player to not to have to go shopping right away, but he goes home and he has an adjustment period where he can feel comfortable and can make his sandwiches or or whatever he wants. And then you you let him go, you know, like like you know, get him adjusted. But those things matter because it's a soft landing in a new spot, and it it's much better to 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 coach them when they come to practice because they have their mind not full with with stuff that they have to deal with off the court but it's easier to to come in and you are a professional and you just t- take care of your stuff that you have to take care of and everything off the court is taken care of beforehand yeah so we see these like these things you know when a player comes he lands at, i don't know after 12 hours uh, flight you give him i don't know salads to to eat on the way back to his apartment. Apartment is is ready with water, with some snacks for the morning, for breakfast. And then, okay, well, after breakfast, he comes to practice. He has time, you know, to go shopping or whatever. But this, let's say, it's, it doesn't cost a lot first few meals, you know, like dinner, let's say, and breakfast. Doesn't cost a lot, you know, but for player, yeah, mentally and everything, it's, it's a lot. You have a player mentally ready for practices immediately, not not like <laughs> now we have a player who landed and he said, "You the one." He said, "Are you hungry?" No. It's like it's your flu. You all like this, this, this. You ate something. So, come on, man. Like you're hungry. You have to be hungry. <laughs> Possible that you're not hungry. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to be a burden. He wants to. He doesn't yeah, want to make a problem. Yeah, yeah. 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 as well. But yes, these small things. You know, you need better transition for. So that's that's those things you you mentioned that helped you also from being a player to go to this job. That you, from your experience as a player, it helped you to understand what a player needs, uh, whether it's from the coaches, from from uh, from the staff behind the scenes. How does how did your player experience help you with the scouting process? Because that's something I think my listeners also would be curious about. Your from the player's perspective, what do you look for when you watch? Obviously, every position is different. You look for different things. But what do you look for? Is there anything particular to look for when you scout a player on tape? Um, you know, whichever level he's coming from, whether it's in Europe lower level or it's in from college. What what's something that you ask people about, or or when you talk to him, what do you look for? Something that in particular that you as a player could only notice yeah okay first of all when we are scouting first of all of course by by the positions we're scouting different things we need shooter we need shooter we you know like the regular regular things how how he uses let's say shooter how he uses standards how it goes if he shoots immediately spot up or whatever or if he what is the common rookie mistake who comes from states that they don't change the pace, they don't change their rhythm going through a stream. They they jog, they jog, and they and they cannot take a shot because the, play, the defender jogs after him, and there is no open shot. So we you know to to go in, we go in, change pace, use fakes. You know we need to teach them. And uh, so far, this is let's say common common mistake and common minus. Let's say when we are scouting Americans. For, rookies you know so we pay this attention we when we know that if we're scouting rookie we're scouting you know, a player second year in a europe we we see we see like if a player already second year in the in the, in europe and he does the same mistake like rookie okay he know he's not willing to, to probably he's not willing to learn he's not willing to adapt he is just you know he wants he wants to stay in the same in the same level and the player don't have a desire to improve and to go to the next. You know, it's hard. And then, of course, character. When we asking, when we asking, the, the main thing is that 
if a player is competitive during the practices and again, if he really wants to win everything, doesn't matter. It's a shooting contest. It's a running up and down. It's, I don't care. But if he don't have this, this is the most, I was the same player. I was the same player. I wanted to win everything and every, every moment, every, every drill, every, if you, if you don't have this passion, like uh, last year we had one, that his agent was pushing that player. He really was, we said, okay, maybe he is, he is not in the, big enough, maybe his size. And, and then we came to conclusion, but guys, look, the way he's fighting, the way he's doing everything, maybe he has less talent, but his heart, his fighters, fighters heart is amazing. We need to, we need to give him a chance. And then we gave him a chance and he became one of our best players. You know? after new year you know so it's it's like this if a player is not willing to fight if the player is not willing to to compete you cannot do nothing you know and this is this is a thing that it's a new generation it's a new thing it's a new thing that that i need and it's a new normal new reality that next game yeah. next drill next 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 like no 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 in, in, my, in, in our team, there is no next. <laughs> or you do it, or you, or you run and compete immediately, or you're going to run 20 times. Just if you want just to run, you're going to run 20 times instead of yeah. two or one, you know. But that's, that's the thing that, that competition or competitiveness when nobody is watching, when only your teammates are watching, the coaches are watching, that's. That's more important than, than the competition and the drive when, when the camera's on, because everybody wants to win and wants to compete when the camera's are on. But you see the real 5 to 10% that you can get out of the per, player in practice, and you see when he's triggered, when he wants to, when he loses a, a, pick, a, a, a scrimmage, that he wants to win the next one. That's, those things matter, and that, that, those things, I think, have, only the coaches the inside knows that you can ask um, through a connection. Yeah, so, yeah. I remember. I remember our practices 2014-15 with Real Madrid. I mean, that was so competitive practice. <laughs> me, me and me and Nacioni would be every other one one guy on the floor, another guy on the floor pushing, <laughs> acting, pulling. I mean, it was so competitive, not in a nice way. Sometimes even fight, these fights and so on, which is which happens between men, you know, but. But it happens. Yeah, it happens on successful teams. Yeah. But then we go on the floor with the same. We put the same jersey. We fight for each other. For each we, other, yes. Other than there is no, you know, there is no, I would say hard feelings or whatever. You did something in a practice. No, 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 no. We fight for each other. That was amazing. That and was one of the most competitive practices during the whole year. I mean, whole year was so competitive, so, so high level that I never met it or before or again after, after. Even in Real Madrid, the next three years was not so competitive like it was, uh, like it was the first year. That's, that's great analysis because there is a huge difference between men and women, obviously, but in terms of how we bond and how we, uh, become brothers, because from from the re from the reading that I did and the podcast that I listened to, women bond more through emotional bonding, through through closure, through experiences together, you know, in a, in a good way. And 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 men bond through struggle, through because of it's it's a it's a a hormonal reaction that takes place that I'm not qualified to explain, but it's something that happens when when during wartime, for example, when the brothers, they fight for each other, they fight, you know, there's some internal conflict, obviously, but you go through struggles together and that makes you brother for life. That makes you something that, that you, you know, that he's going to stand by you. You're going to stand by him no matter what, because you went through all the grind, all the hustle together. And until this day, the people I talked to that I played with, or, or even, even the national team players that we were all together in the same boat, we struggled with the same things. We, we struggled with the same uh, topics, you know, whether we had fights amongst each other, verbal fights, f fist fights, you know, you I mean, it's, we saw it, we saw it all, but that makes you also brothers for life because you see, it's a different connection that you have with other people off the court. That's exactly, exactly. This is, this, these things uh, between men in a man 
team in the man or man organization. It's yes. Without this, you cannot make a great group, the winning group, the group team or winning. I don't know, successful team, the winning team or whatever. So the last, la the last thing I wanted to talk to you about um, before we go into into the ATOs, uh, from from your perspective, also your experiences. And now in your current position, which you also experience as a player, what do you expect from your assistant coaches? What are some things that assistant coaches or assistant coaches, video scouts that are on the on the um, floor with you during the games that you see some information, something that you need to that you need to some feedback that you need to hear? What are some things you look for uh, also in your current role that you tell the assistant coaches to to be more aware of? Okay, first of all, assistant coaches is. Uh the connection the connection between the good assistant coaches they are a connection between team and the, and the head coach in my opinion because I always have this you know like a good cup and bad cup so we have this uh, this the same like the connection between between uh, the assistant coaches and the team I know I I have to know the ins kind of inside I would say information If somebody is feeling bad, but somebody like uh, we we had uh, in the past uh, some some things that you know a system coach is shooting to the player and he says I'm homesick. I don't know. I'm, something happened, you know, and and the, actually what happened, you know, we through the agent later on because it wasn't wasn't he 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 was not willing to. To open up to us through the agent, they found out the struggles at home and so on and so on. We let him go a few days home. He came back, another person, you know. Yeah. So these things, I mean, tactical things. It's on on coach, on the head coach, and what he wants. But for me, like, I trust our coaches from a tactical perspective, like tactical way things. But all these small things, like outside the outside the court life. And so on. Then the players a little bit open, opening up to assistant coaches during the individual shoot shoot arounds or whatever. I need I need to know even you know to pay attention on small. I was say, say red marks. No, I don't know how. Red flags. Small, red flags. Red, 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 on the small red flags that you know, for a moment for a moment uh, we were. Struggling to understand what happened to this player that for one month he cannot he cannot perform good, and he said about this. That system coach came to me. Something happened at home. So okay, I started to 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 check through the agents. Through it. I found out the situation two days ago. Out, no go. He was like, "Why you fired me? No, no, no. Go home, fix your problems, come back." And he came back. Actually, became time seventy three. I think over a month in LKL. <laughs> you know, these things, you know, these things, you know, it happens like this. I need to know this. This yeah. is what I assistant coaches and from the uh, physical condition coach, from our doctor, you yeah. know, to I, I read, I heard uh, your podcast, I think one of the last podcast message. Yeah. It's like how, how, how important it is to, to choose. The right persons in a physio, a physios, as they are. So this is this is exactly what I am doing because, and this I understand and I get it from my players' experience as well. You know, this all the actually all these things comes from players' experience. But now I need to, I don't need to to talk my feelings to others. I need to to try to solve problems for others now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You. And you need to pick up on those that information is out there, and you need to pick up the little details of the information to make for you to make the right decision to go on forward. Important. Max. Yes. 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 So before we go into the ATOs, uh, I I pick I made a mistake that I wore a a a beige beige sweater with with the background that's the same beige, uh, but uh, allow me to uh, correct your English. <laughs> But payback time, buddy. No, um, I, I, um, uh, one thing I think you probably misspoke, but I, I, I wrote it down was when you said, uh, crunches instead of crutches. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crunches, yeah. Grunt, crunch, yeah. crunches is uh, sit ups. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had to put it out there, but I had to. Um, so ATOs, we're going to go through it quickly. The first thing that comes to your mind, you know, you know the process. You listen to enough uh, episodes, so um, let's let's go. If you had to teach a class in basketball, uh, as uh, what what part of the game would you teach? If you go to university, you have to teach one one hour of basketball, whether it's on the court or off the court. What's what's the thing you teach? Sure. Probably I'm going to explain the same things like uh, that without uh, competition during the, uh, I mean, if it's going to be on a court in practice or just a verbal like explanation or whatever. Either or. Either or. Hey, so I would, I, would, I would say I would explain that this, like we said before, that without competition, without competitive practices, without these struggles, you cannot build a winning team. Uh, so, not how to come off staggers. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I'm, or, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not to come off stagger screens. Well, I would have enough time. <laughs> okay, if if not a career in basketball after you stop playing, what else would you have uh, go, went into? I mean, I cannot imagine my, I cannot imagine my life without basketball. In in some kind of uh, position or GM or or coach. Coach, no, but uh, maybe some uh, federation, some kind of position, so, somewhere, somewhere. I cannot imagine. I would, I would say, I would go, maybe with a real estate to do some, something. I mean, best advice you received as a player. Best advice I received as a player. Probably that would be that would be from Maurizio Balducci, basketball. Basketball won't stop without you. So you need to take care of yourself. And we were talking, he was saying this about, about my duty, about the injury, but later on he explained it about that when I finished career and like what, what's going to, basketball never stops. So you need, you, you, you have to understand that you are just a small part of, of basketball world and you need to, to take care of yourself and, not to be, not to be, you know, like a baby. Uh, why nobody paying attention to me? Why are they people not taking pictures now anymore with me? Why, you know, these things like you need to realize that you, you already done and uh, basketball does without you won't stop. It, you need to take care of yourself and find your, you, you need to find a place in basketball world, but, but basketball people won't, I would say, basket, if you're going to disappear, basketball people are not going to miss you. Yeah, that's something I would like to talk to you about more later at, at maybe some other episode uh, in, in about something m mind mindfully that you go through after you retire. But that's for another podcast. Uh, best or advice that you would give to yourself from your current self to your younger self when you start off playing. Enjoy, enjoy every moment, enjoy every moment and doesn't matter what's happened, you lose or whatever, take, uh, take, take, the, take something from every loss or every win and, and enjoy every moment because it's short, 10 years and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> For every moment and it's short. Uh, best worthwhile professional investment. Professional best, investment. What, what did you purchase or what did you invest in for your professional career that oh. you feel like that was the best investment I did? I mean, probably all my therapy, therapy things, like uh, I, I, I started to take care of, my, of myself more uh, after injuries or all these uh, game ready, not my tech, all these complex, all these machines uh, that it helps me to recover, uh, to recover after practices, you know, after games, you know, I need, you don't need to lose time, you know, more in a, in a locker room, you have everything at home and so on. So these are my best probably investments. What, what's the biggest challenge for you during the season right now in the current role right now? During the season is I don't know, not to get, not to get to, I would say, I'm a good 
Okay, first of all, like the biggest challenge because now we are losing a lot of games because we have brand new teams with 11, brand new team with 11 uh, new players. So to be patient, to be patient. Not, not to get down on yourself. Yeah, but to, to be patient, patient coaches, to be patient with some players, with rookie, and uh, not to make like fast decisions without giving enough time for players, you know, to adjust and, and uh, I would say, because immediately you lose two, three games, you want to make changes. Yeah. You want to make change do something, you know, but you need to give time. So this is the and most challenge. Most it's teams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your emotions in check. <laughs> and the biggest challenge after the season. I believe the biggest challenge after the season is like immediately to, to start recruiting new players. To talk to, to talk to to the biggest challenge again to 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 sit in front of computer and start scouting. This is <laughs> the challenge that you actually would like to to spend some time with family more, or whatever, and to travel. So you need to know how to to mix it and to to find the time for both. And the last question that I ask almost every guest, I didn't ask everyone, but the favorite failure, and we talked about the French game in, 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 in 2014 uh, for, the, for the bronze medal match. But apart from that, what's your favorite failure that you remember the most and you learned the most from, if you go back? I think it would, it would be like uh, what, uh, what I learned from uh, in 2016 against Australia, we lost a lot. What? That, that actually, that I always, if you remember, I got some some offensive fouls immediately and so on. So at the end of the day, when I watched the game, I think they forced me to do this mm. by actually getting the ball in my hand and forcing my mistakes and forcing for me I would say to do what I'm not capable to do. To play pick and roll, to penetrate, and then charge, charge. I got three offensive fouls in first quarter, probably. And then I, I check at the game. I thought that I opened that, that, but at the end, then I checked it. I watched the game after. I said, okay, we lost that game a lot. And so on. And I said, okay, they, actually tricked with me showing that it's open lane and everything, <laughs> everything come, come here muscle of they put some uh, bait yes good job that was I didn't think of that word <laughs> all right let's finish let's finish on a high thanks a lot Jonas it was it was uh, great catching up and I hope we can do the next one Lithuanian with with something I have some more things in mind for the Lithuanian culture and mindset. So maybe we can do the next one in Lithuanian. For sure. For sure. It would be better. <laughs> <laughs> Reverse payback. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. It was nice to be a part of your podcast, finally. <laughs> I told you. I told you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.